We're now live and awake. Whew, we made it. <laughs> Too much StarCraft 2 this morning. Um, man, JSON versus the world. In my other life, I'd like to really be a StarCraft 2 caster instead of doing tea because all they have to do is watch little bionic insects and robots chase each other around. But that's okay. The life that I live is a tea life, so that's, that's fine by me. <laughs> Welcome to today's tea practice today, friends. Today's day 32. Are you tired of this yet? I'm not. This is great. Um, day 32 of our daily tea practice. I hope you guys are doing good this lovely Saturday. And yeah, we're going to be doing some practice with this stuff. Golden needles. Um, golden needles are a kind of black tea that are used, um, are made using the buds of the tea plant. And I wanted to do black tea today because the poor challenge reminded me that uh, I also feel like black teas kind of go by the wayside for me. I think like oolong and white teas are the best for me, and then green teas, and then pueros and black teas at the end. But that's that's changed now, right? After poor love. So I just wanted to do that review for myself of the black teas. So we'll be doing a couple different golden needles today. We'll be doing one from Fujian, we'll be doing one from, um, or a couple of them from Yunnan province, and then we'll do one from Nepal, just because I wanted to throw something else into the mix that's not so Chinese-centric. The poor love challenge by its nature is pretty China-centric, so we'll mix it up a little bit today. Yeah. So bonjour, bonjour to uh, Jeremy and Eric. I will talk to you in your native language of St. Louis. <laughs> 23 Axe Lala is here too. Looks like you like uh, Golden Needles. Lovely. I asked Steven if he'd do a brewing showdown with me, but he's like, not today. <laughs> he doesn't want to embarrass me on a Saturday morning, I guess. Saturday afternoon. <laughs> and Ronan is here. Bonsoir to you, my friend. Let's get the show on the road. Usually when I do comparisons like this, I do like to do the bowl brewing method. But... Um, Today I just wanted to brew some tea, kind of focus in. We've been using a lot of teaware, playing around with a lot of just extra bells and whistles lately. So I feel like I'm coming back into this, just use a gaiwan, use a, a cup to pour into. You don't always have to do experiments to understand tea. I think it's good to throw them in there. I tend to do more than average, so I try to be mindful about coming back to just hot water, the gaiwan, leaves, cup, you know? Because otherwise, you know, when you're actually out there in the world, you're not doing an experiment with like the, the heat gun and everything. You're just kind of there pouring tea. As I like to do. Hope you guys are doing okay today. Uh, let me know what you guys are brewing today. It's always nice to know what's going on on the other side of the screen. Uh, Jeremy's having charcoal dongding from You Know Who. That's French for floating leaves. <laughs> Um, T. Sleuth, I, I'm joking with Eric because he's from St. Louis, but technically it's St. Louis, right? It's not St. Oh, I don't even know. <laughs> yeah. St. Louis is a nice place. Missouri. I really like that. <laughs> Missouri? <laughs> Missouri? <sighs> We're in Nevada. We're very far away from Missouri. We miss you, Eric. We miss all of you guys. But it's nice to be able to share tea with uh, all y'all this lovely Saturday morning. Which one should I do first? Hey, 23 asks the Lolo, which uh, tea should we do first? You are the one who got really excited about golden needles. And I know, Instagram friends, I did not announce the, the stream before we started. We were running late. We had breakfast, you know, do our Saturday thing. We haven't had like a full day off since the beginning of this thing, um, which is fine by me. Tea doesn't really work, but it's, it's still work. <laughs> um, Chris Van uh, Genderen? I'm sure I didn't get that right. But Chris, welcome to the stream today. Welcome to Daily Tea Practice. We're about to spin up some black tea, specifically golden needles. If it's my choice, I would probably start with the Fujian uh, golden needles. I have one from Shangti in... Are they in... Yeah, they are in, in Missouri. Maybe that this is a sign. We should do a vendor from Missouri. This is Shangti from Kansas City. It's not very golden though, but they're calling it Golden Needle King, so how about we do that? Is that alright? Let's, let's show you guys how these babies look. Opening up the sample package, I've had this tea before, but I forgot what it looked like. It's not very buddy, but this is what they're calling Golden Needle King. It's not super needly, right? But there are buds there, and to be fair, the Fujian black teas 
uh, from Fujian province in China, they tend to have smaller buds than the Yunnan ones. The Yunnan ones tend to be very dramatic. Let me show you the, the Yunnan southern needles in uh, the container. Just for comparison purposes, so you know what we're, gonna, we're up against later on. This is the more typical kind of like Yunnan silver needles, bigger buds because they're from a different kind of tea tree out there that's a little bit bigger, daya, big leaves, the, the buds are big too. And then um, these are the smaller buds from Fujian. I have a big bias for Fujian black tea, so I think it's okay for me to start with this one. Is that alright with you guys? Lion, I wonder if you might even have some of this tea to brew with us today. It's the uh, golden red needles? Golden needle king. Sorry, we're not for the monarchy here in America. <laughs> golden needle king from Shanti in Missouri. So, yeah. First thing we'll start with today. That all right? Okay. Let's use the whole sample. Why not? So golden needles compared to other kinds of black teas will tend to be a little bit smoother, a little bit often more sweet, but in a more punchy kind of way. This is why I like talking about like the feeling of the tea, because if you say that the buds are punchy, you might be surprised when you brew them up and they're quite sweet. They're kind of punchy in a different way. It's like that kind of crouching tiger hidden that they got, because the buds, as you, a lot of you know, have a lot of kind of goodness packed into them. What do I want to do with this? So I haven't brewed this tea in a while. When you're faced with a tea you haven't brewed in a while, your uh, hack is to smell the empty gaiwan. I mean, the, the, the preheated gaiwan with the dry leaves inside as a kind of preview. Oh, very sweet. So I'm, I'm thinking about how I'm going to approach this tea because I haven't had it in a long time. It's very sweet, very Fujian, and then underlying the sweetness is that really punchy kind of classic golden buds thing going on. So I feel like I can, I want to bring out the sweetness of this tea, but I want to respect how potent these can get if I overbrew them just a little bit. Um, yeah, and then these are very tiny leaves, right? You can compare them to the Yunnan silver needle or the Yunnan red needle. And I want to make sure that I don't overbrew these because if I do, that sweetness will go away. It's going to be a little bit maybe too intense. So when starting out with a new tea, I will baby it just a little bit. So instead of pouring directly on the leaves, I'm going to use my Bonavita. Bonavita haters. Suck it. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Eric. And using the gooseneck, you can pour in onto the edge of the gaiwan instead of on the leaves themselves. So when you're hitting the edge of the leaves, you're extracting more. But if you pour just on the edge of the gaiwan, you have like kind of like two seconds. Not even two seconds, like it's like a half second where the, the, the water can cool. And I'm going to do it on different edges of the gaiwan because where I first start pouring, it's going to get really hot. I want to drop the temperature just a little bit. And then you'll see that because I did this, the leaves have kind of floated up to the top. Some of them weren't hit. I try to get them kind of just swirled in in the process, but if not, just going to give them a quick little dip so that everything's evenly infusing. I don't want dry leaves when they're already wet leaves getting infused. And this will be a very quick steep, just because I don't know what to expect from this tea after a really, really long time not having it. Yeah. We should expect it to be pretty sweet, pretty mellow, but with some kind of electric energy to it because they are buds. Yeah, this is going to be a little bit lighter than I want it to be, but I want to just check it out. How's it going, you know? Really pretty color. Boom. Okay, and then making sure that the leaves aren't getting infused extra with the water in the bottom. You can see that on the bottom, there's that little trail of... There we go, see all that stuff? I like to tilt my gaiwan when it's resting just so that that wastewater isn't brewing out. But if now that it's all kind of like decanted by itself, I'll just pour that out so it's not continuing to oversteep my leaves. I really don't like the taste of leaves that have been kind of sitting in a little bit of gaiwan water. I can kind of taste it. Yeah, cool. Looks pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> what did I miss? My uh, mizohi? 
people have been really active. <laughs> um, Eric's guess was Jinjun Mei. Pretty close. Jinjun Mei is a Fujian black tea using mostly buds, but Jinjun Mei needs to be from you know, like the Wuishan area. You'll find like Tongmu Jinjun Mei, which is a place that supposedly it really should be the center of Jinjun Mei production. So even if it's the same material, ideally Jinjin Mei should be from a specific place. So I like that they're just calling this Golden Needle King because it's not from the original Jinjin Mei area. I wouldn't be surprised if you find this exact tea being sold somewhere else as a Jinjin Mei to make use of the fame, the kind of oomph factor of that, that brand. But it's just a Golden Needle from Fujian. Woo, punchy, wow. That's not as sweet as I expected it to be. That's very punchy. I'm awake. <laughs> Holy crap. That's very malty though. Really, really, really malty. Wow. Whew. Gabby, welcome to uh, Black Tea Practice today. Uh, Iranti is here. DRBR153 is here. Um, what are you guys talking about? Fries! <laughs> oh my god. Lion says that this is the tea that TDB, which is a tea review kind of educational website run by James and Danny. They said that this tastes like McDonald's fries. Oh my god. Now that you're saying that, I want to see if it does taste like McDonald's fries to me. Hey, I like McDonald's fries. I don't think this tastes like McDonald's fries. It's I think what they're referring to might be kind of that thick, kind of oily, really satisfying thing going on about it. But I don't get McDonald's fries from that. If someone can find me a tea that tastes like McDonald's fries, it'd be very difficult to go back to anything else because <laughs> I really like McDonald's fries. Yeah, I do have that violin kung fu too, Lion. Um, now I'm curious. <sighs> Tasty. And um, I did not pour out the first steep of this tea. I don't tend to rinse my teas. I do now for show pour, as we've all learned that it's important to <laughs> rinse show pour. But for this guy, I'm going to just jump right in. We'll do the second infusion. I'm gonna keep dropping the temperature here. I mean, it's pretty good, but I want a little bit more sweetness coming out from this, I would say, Stephen. It's pretty sweet. It's not bad, but I'm just a sweet tooth, and the more kind of chocolatey stuff I can get from the tea, the better. Or maybe I'm not respecting what this tea wants to do. We'll see what happens next. Um, Jeremy says that the donding he's having from floating leaves is ch crazy chocolatey. It's a very good donding. <laughs> you rinse them if you don't want to get smashed. Yeah, uh, golden buds tend to have higher amounts of caffeine. And because it's a black tea, the theanine isn't going to be as high. So when it comes to tea, how punchy something is isn't just the level of caffeine. It's also how much theanine is up there. So if a tea is high in caffeine, but it's also high in theanine, like, you know, some of the Japanese shaded teas, they're going to cancel each other out a little bit, just in general terms. It's not very scientific to say that, but they kind of meet each other in the middle. But if you have a black tea that's very, like, kind of like middle in caffeine, and then low in theanine, this caffeine is going to take over, and then you're going to get all jittery. And I, I believe that's why a lot of people feel like black teas tend to be more punchy and more high in caffeine than other teas because it's uh, it feels like there's more caffeine in there because there's less theanine to help you out. This is very nice though. Nice aftertaste, very classic Chinese black tea. If you guys haven't had a lot of uh, Chinese black teas, they tend to be a little bit different from the Indian black teas and Kenyan black teas that we're so familiar with in our tea bags. Uh, it's like Lipton, but better, but different. <laughs> Second steep here. Ooh, it's even more malty than before. I did combine the two steeps, I tend to do that, but even more malty than before. Wow, that's really malty. What the hell? 
I'm gonna, you know, shake the leaves so that they're not kind of crowding on the edge of the like I want and steaming each other. But I will close that. Very, very malty. But I'd say almost no bitterness at all. Very, very good. Um, leaves in hot water, welcome to the stream today. From Joe from Fish Anywhere, welcome to the stream today as well. We're doing golden needles, black tea. We'll do one from Fujian. We'll probably do a couple more steeps on this one. Then we'll go into a Yunnan silver needle, just, I mean, a Yunnan golden needle, black tea. Probably we'll do just this one we tossed out into the cup earlier. Uh, this first one is from Fujian. It's from Shangti. It's called Golden Needle King. We'll do a golden needle from, from Yunnan. And then we'll do the one from Nepal too, just so we don't get too China-centric with our tea practice recently. <laughs> and not too East Asia-centric, because there's a lot of good stuff going on in, in that area of the world too. Jeremy says Stephen would be awesome on live. I, I told him, and he's like, uh, I don't <laughs> want to go on live because people want to watch. I'm like, okay. So I'll do 40 days, and then Stephen can do 40 days. How's that? Yes? Yes? Put the hearts on so Stephen can see it where he's watching from the other side of the table. And then I can take a break for once. <laughs> uh, Trekking Wood is here. How's it going, Joshua? We're having some golden needle tea. What else is everyone having? I think Jeremy had a dong ding. I'm not sure what everyone else is having other than that. Maybe I missed out. Uh, yeah, we were too busy talking about french fries and tea. Supposedly this tea or a tea from the same company is supposed to have like some french fry vibes to it. I'm not getting it here. It is very satisfying, kind of chewy. Some black teas will be very bold in terms of flavor and then the texture is very thin and that's what makes things very sharp. Big flavor, thin, thin uh, texture. It's like a needle. It, like it hurts a lot but it's so tiny so it's sharp, right? <laughs> Stupid. So you know, it's it's almost like these needles aren't that pokey. They're like they're like instead of being like needles that'll hurt you, they're like the massage needles. Like they hurt like a little bit, but they're more so like soothing and satisfying. <sighs> no bitterness, almost no bitterness. Um, lions having some Louis Sejak tea from Korea. Um, let's see. Jeremy says, or my shy self could do a live with Delphine. Oh, if my shy self could do a live. What, what, what did that happen? Did we miss that? Wow. We'll need to go live together more, I think. I enjoyed the interviews that we did with our friends last week over in Puar, uh, Love Challenge Territory. And more than just interviews, maybe like just, you know, together brewing would be really fun to see how everyone brews the same tea differently, you know? A lot of us do have the same teas. And Joe's still working on that Taiping from this morning. I saw that you're working hard on that tea this morning, Joe. I'm really happy to see that. I kind of miss working with a tea like nonstop until I figure it out. When was the last time I did that? I did that with that Korean green tea on day one, I think. Eric was the one who um, asked me to do a Korean green tea. We brewed it just four times and I could not get it to really impress me. So maybe it was just the tea. Sometimes it's just the tea, but sometimes it's you or me. <laughs> Since then, we haven't really gotten it to work. I think we've done that same tea two or three more times. Steven strutted a couple times. It's just not a good, like, it's not a fantastic tea. It's decent though. Um, Teapot Rescue Society, how's it going? Welcome. Um, from God, from Brisbane, Arizona, is that right? <laughs> Pronoun is having nothing right now. Oh, lost in the papers. It's okay. We're holding it down for you. <laughs> uh, Eric says, I want to go live, interview me about, hey, what? You, you can go live. You've been live already. You don't need to, to interview about anything. Maybe that Korean tea, another region of the world that I'm not so, uh, not so familiar with. You really need more help with that. Uh, Lion, who's had uh, some of the red teas from this company before, or black teas, Hongcha. 
I find Shang's red teas very rustic. For me, brewing them lighter brings out more nuance. It's not my preferred style of red or black teas. I agree, actually. I've had much sweeter Fujian black tea than this, and sweetness is not all I'm going for. Something else to consider is I believe almost all of Shang Ti's teas are low intervention, meaning not a lot of fertilizer or pesticide are used on them, if at all. He's very particular about that. And so sometimes those teas will read as it being a little bit more rustic and less kind of coming on to you because they are not being assisted as much by the fertilizer, pesticide, I'm not sure, but tendencies are the more kind of in your face, crazy, like, holy crap, this tastes like, like, butter. And there's no other note. Tendencies are that'll be a tea that's gotten some help. So a good example of this is Yokuro. I've asked a, a lot of different Japanese tea experts, and they just, it's very difficult to find low intervention Gyokuro that has that same Gyokuro, like, what you expect from that tea, because the, the plant suffers so much from the shading that it needs the help. So maybe that's why this is a little bit more rustic, or it could just be the tea maker's taste. You could argue that if you're making a black tea, you might as well make it punchy. So I think it depends on the person. Let's see if I can brew it just a little bit lighter. Um, I'm not going to reboil this. This is probably at like 85 degrees Celsius now, I'm guessing. Where, where is this at? Still here. 81 degrees Celsius. So pretty light. I think I like this temperature to try it out again. I'm going to pour again on the size of the guy I want to really baby this tea. See what I can get from it. It's very good though. Nice kind of classic Chinese black tea taste. You like it, Steven? Yeah. Yeah, I like it too. A lot of beautiful color too. I can just see how clear the liquor is. And when you're just evaluating tea, you want that liquor to be very, very clear, almost see-through to the bottom. You want it to look more like a pristine lake in the Pacific rather than, I don't know, what's a crappy looking lake? Lake Mead? Oh. <laughs> Our local Lake Mead sucks. Okay, things about Lake Mead suck. Lake Mead doesn't suck. It, it provides us water. We shouldn't say that. <laughs> Okay, Stephen, help me chug this, because Lion says that Shang tends to brew it fairly light in the shop when I visited. I might be brewing this a little bit too hard. Uh, I, like I do, it it I do, it. yeah, it does. It does stand up to it. Um, he says, what are his instructions here? He's got like Western brewing instructions on the packet. I do use pretty long infusions for my teas for gong fu style. I've seen people who are like, oh my god, it's gotta be five to ten seconds only. And I used to do that. I think that I've kind of moved away from that just because I can take a little bit of bite if the tea wants to bite back. But the better the tea, the less you have to baby it. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> Shining Lion. Lion says, thank you for not saying liqueur. Yeah, liqueur is uh, it's a it's a it's a li it's a form of liquor, right? It's not this is not a liqueur, it's liquor. So, yeah. Anyone who says otherwise is a liquor. I'm just kidding. That's a really bad joke. <laughs> uh, Jeremy Lake Ontario. I've I've never been there. I'm sure it's Ontario cool, and Ontario Ontario. <laughs> That's really bad. I'm sorry. Um, if only you were by Lake Erie, because uh, then my jokes would be so good, it would be eerie. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah, I actually like this tea better, I would say, Lion. Thank you for the suggestion to brew it just a little bit lighter. This is why I like to do these lives with you, um, and you, we couldn't do this in the bowl brewing style, you know? So I like to mix it up. This tea does better for my taste, I would say, with the lighter steep. That sweetness comes out just a little bit more, it's a little bit smoother, silkier. Yeah, I like it. Nice, nice. Thank you. Very good. It brings up kind of almost like this tapioca sweetness that I like a lot. 
in Chinese black teas and sometimes Taiwanese oolong tends to have this. Lovely. Yeah, I like it. I think I'd want it to just be somewhere in between where I had it before and where it is right now. So I'm going to try to dial in there before we move on to the next tea. We'll do five steeps out of that tea. I think it's a pretty fair kind of look at what the tea is. And then we'll throw it into a bowl and drink it later while we do our, our weekend chores instead of lying in bed and watching StarCraft all day. <laughs> uh, Jeremy says we have some steep jokes. Yeah, my humor has a lot of depth. Like a lake. Isn't it great? Okay, so last sheep, I hope I make it a good one. I'm gonna bring up the temperature a little bit, probably stop it at 90 degrees Celsius, and then pour on the sides of the guy one, leave it just a little bit, maybe about the same amount of time actually. There's more leaf in there than I usually use. Uh, STL and ASU Lighting, welcome to Tea Practice today. We're doing a Golden Needle Black Tea from Fujian. I'm getting impatient. <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to pour on the sides of the guy one, not on the leaves, but that's okay. We're getting there. And then we're about to switch over to a Yunnan Golden Needle in just a little bit. So this Fujian Silver Needle, quite malty, pretty sweet, almost perfect texture. Something about these Chinese teas, they almost always get the texture just, just on point. Really lovely. Good, 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 good. The aftertaste is very nice. Not quite cooling, but just nice and present, sweet. Nice. Finish this off for me. And very satisfying. I feel like I've had a meal already. Right, Steven? It's like a bowl of soup. That's how satisfying that is. Wow. Delicious. Steven, you just left all the, the bits. You're gonna make me drink that? I like drinking the bits, so I don't mind. I don't use a filter just because I feel like it kind of changes the taste of the tea. And I don't mind the bits. But I, I will use a filter if I'm pouring for someone else or I'll just be a little bit more careful about how I use the Gaiwan. This is actually Steven's Gaiwan. It's not my favorite Gaiwan in the world, but I'm trying to practice with it lately. It's a kind of Gaiwan that's a little bit taller than usual. So my other ones are maybe just a tiny bit smaller. This is a tall profile Gaiwan. Supposedly it should help with aromatics. We'll let that rest. Whew, wow, satisfying tea. Oof. Wow. It's not even... Is it tea chi? I guess it could be tea chi. Um, on the topic of cha chi, which we've been talking about a lot with puar, I think all tea can have tea energy, but black teas tend to have a little bit different kind of tea energy. I think each type of tea has its own effect. Of course, each type of tea has its own kind of chemicals associated with it, like the, the polyphenols, the caffeine, the L-theanine, so of course it's going to affect you in a different way. This one isn't so much heady, then it is just really satisfying. Like, I would like to just go back and take a nap again. Not that we've had a nap yet, but just... Yeah, very satisfying, very homey. Rustic is a good wor word for it. Um, Ronan is joining us with some yencha. Seems like you are a fan of late night yancha. <laughs> uh, Teapot Rescue Society says never had golden needle, but I love Yunnan gold. Is that the same? Oftentimes it is, yeah. So Yunnan gold is like this stuff. So it's gold because it's called, it's, the buds are gold. <laughs> so sometimes this is called Dian Hong too. Dian is like a, like a, a shortcut for the province of Yunnan in terms of naming. So Dian Hong would be the Yunnan black teas, Min Hong would be Fujian black teas, although that word Min Hong isn't used as much, I find, in the West. And yeah, sometimes though, vendors will see someone's fancy name for a tea and like, Yunnan Gold? I like that name! And then they'll use it for a tea that's not Yunnan Gold because they don't know. <laughs> Which is okay, like I can't blame them for not 
I can blame them for not knowing. They're vendors, right? But <laughs> it doesn't happen that often. But I have seen some vendors who are especially just starting out who are like, wow, Yunnan Gold is such a nice name. And then they use it for like a standard Yunnan black tea, which isn't gold at all with no buds. Because they're like, oh, gold meaning like it's a gold standard, right? Or something. I've seen it happen a lot with um, Taiwanese oolongs where people will name their oolongs jade oolongs and you know this is a, a little you can debate about this but i want to use the word jade oolong for the oolong that's made from the cultivar Yi, which is jade right so uh yeah i don't want to call any green oolong jade oolong because there is a jade oolong and it's kind of confusing when they call it jade oolong when it's not jade oolong anyway yes this should be gunan gold if uh, that's what you have. Just look at the leaves. If it's golden, like gold needles like this, it doesn't have to be pure gold necessarily, as long as it's buds. Yeah. And depending on how fuzzy the buds are, they can get really fluffy, almost like silver needle but gold. Uh, that happens sometimes too. I don't have any of those with me today on the table. I do have some in my box, but I want it to just kind of, just a standard, standard golden needle. And Lion's having some uh, Taiwanese Shancha, wild black tea from Taiwan. And Fronan, yeah, it's comforting and I'm able to sleep after. That's a, that's a good call. We were really close to doing a roasted oolong. I kind of wanted to hit, hit up Jeremy from TJ and be like, Hey dude, you doing some dong ding today? But uh, I wanted to play around with something different. We do a lot of oolong here at Tea Curious HQ. Oolong bias. <laughs> It's a good kind of tea drunk, you know, that we're, we're feeling right now. Very relaxed, very soft. I like it a lot. Steven, verdict on this one? You like it? Yep. Yeah, I think it's a solid. We'll save these for later. There's more oomph in these leaves. We could probably just cold brew these later. I think I liked it. The, that first tea. Really? Yeah. The heavier brew. Oh. Mm, yeah. Somewhere in the middle I was hoping for. I don't think I got the brew that was like, oh, this is the one. I don't think I really figured this out quite perfectly, but... It's good though. It's not bad, yeah. How would you rate it on a scale of 1 to 10? Steve is not going to ask The Valtese or...? <laughs> Just your general liking. Of it. 8. Wow, that's pretty high. I call it like a 6.5. Maybe like a 7. But not like a 7.5, that's too high. <laughs> it's the best tea I've had all day. It's the first one. <laughs> okay, next time, Jeremy says, better luck next time. We will do it next time. We're gonna do this guy. This is the Golden Needle Ripe of Yongda. Where is Yongda again? Oh, this is a Pu'er. Let's not do that. <laughs> Jesus, yeah. I almost- wow, why is this in the black tea box? Golden needle ripe pu'er. This is a gong ting pu'er. That's why I was like, why are they so- they're so like- Oh wow, I should have smelled the, the bag. It's the same material, but this is actually fermented into pu'er. Let's not do that. I almost- I almost shocked myself. I'm not in the pu'er mood today. Whew. So you can take the same material from golden needle and make it into pu'er. But we'll do an actual black golden needle. See, I'm always prepared. I always have a backup. This is definitely from Yunnan. Definitely a, a golden needle. Yeah. Oh no, this will smell like poor now. Let's use another. <laughs> we need to put that in the. We need to put that in the the poor box. Oh re. Oh re. No worries. We got the actual golden needles. Black tea. So instead of fermenting it, we'll oxidize it, make this happen. There you go. Yeah. So crisis averted. I would have been shocked. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Why is it so fermenty? Am I tasting everything poor now? I think I would have caught it once I brewed it, but I didn't catch it just from the eyes because some of those. 
Some of those can look very dusty. Like this is definitely black tea. It's from Nepal, but look how dusty it is. It almost looks like that shopor um, because of the hairs. Was not ready for that. <laughs> Teapath, welcome to Teapath today. Um, Teapot West Society is having Brothers of the Forest, um, a black tea from Mad Monk. I know them. I met them like a long, long time ago. I haven't seen them in ages though. I wonder how they're doing. Uh, Ace of Lighty, what's the water to tea ratio you use for red teas? Um, this is 100 ml or so. I It depends on the red tea. I really adjust my brewing style for how much tea I end up putting in the gaiwan. But when you have a gaiwan, do you have a gaiwan, my friend? Um, or what do you like to use for tea, for red tea specifically? But I like to just cover the bottom. But if it's like a sample like this, I'm not going to want to reseal the sample, right? Because I got to like put a, put a paper clip on it and stuff. And this is a 3.5 gram sample, so I just dump the whole thing in. I rather just work with what I have rather than measure it out per ratio. So actually I was brewing a little bit faster than usual with that much leaf because I tend to not use that much leaf. Um, around 3 grams, you know? But not much more than that. I used to be someone who used the 7 grams a lot, did the flash teeps, but I find that I don't need that much tea to be satisfied and you can work with the, the tea even with a lower ratio, I think. Um, 100 ml gaiwan, usually I put 46 grams, that works too. Yeah. I think once it gets a little bit too crazy for me, it's like 8 to 10 grams, it's a little bit too much for me. I will do that maybe if I have like a, no, not, not even that, yeah, eight, 8 to 10 grams for 100 ml is just a little bit too much for me, but anywhere below that, the range I can work with, yeah. Uh, hey, stock. welcome to today's tea practice. Where are you um, tuning in from, everyone? I know we have some friends from Europe who are up really late, which I'm really happy we switched to 1 p.m. here so we could catch you guys. Really happy. And yeah, it's like 1.30ish p.m., 1.40ish probably by now, here in Vegas. We're drinking some Golden Needle. We started with a Fujian Golden Needle. I almost tricked myself into drinking some Golden Needle pour. For some pour, I accidentally put in our black tea box, but no worries, we have some backup tea. We're doing a Yunnan Golden Needle now. Really beautiful tea, really gorgeous. From a vendor I really like, but before I say, because I haven't had this tea. It's horrible, I don't wanna throw them under the bus. <laughs> Actually, this vendor changed my mind about Yunnan Dian Hong, so I'm willing to bet that this is gonna be really, really good. Yeah. Golden Needle tends to be a little bit lighter than you think, so I'm gonna load it up, actually. Yeah, let's just load it up. More than I use again, but just work with it. Make sure that when your guy one is being switched over, make sure that there's no leaves from the previous session. I don't want my Yunnan black tea to taste like Fujian black tea, right? That would be a disaster. The word will end. It's not gonna be Corona that kills us. It's re accidentally cleaning off the edge of her guy one lid. That's what's gonna get us all. But no, not today. <laughs> okay, let's smell this baby. Not much smell. Hmm. So we'll do a trick. Smell it. Ooh. It's very mild. Which is exciting to me because sometimes the very mild smelling black teas are the ones with the most kind of like... They got some depth to them. But I don't want it to smell like something. And it, it does have some scents. It's kind of got that silky, oily smell you get a lot from Dian Hong, right? Anyone? Um, I think Verdant Tea was the first vendor I saw to call it olive oil, and I really agree with that tasting note. A lot of these Dian Hongs have that olive oil kind of thing going on. Yeah. Nice. So less of a like, aromatic smell, it's more of like a, a textural smell. It's very full, but if you're not looking for flavor notes, you might, or if you're trying to look for flavor notes, it's very difficult to pick up from the smell of this particular tea. So I feel like this tea will not be as punchy as most Dian Hong. Dian Hong can be very like, bam, like very malty, a little bit fruity, like a tiny bit, you know. 
Yunnan black teas will tend to be a little bit more punchy than Fujian black teas, but since I'm previewing this tea, I do know how to brew just standard Fuji uh, Yunnan black tea. This one I think will be a little bit more mellow than most. That's why I like to preview it. Let's see if I'm right. I've never had this before. I trust the person who gave it to me. And I'm gonna hit it with boiling water because I feel like this can take it. It's brewing up very quickly, which tells me the surface of the leaf is pretty, you know, well rolled and wow, yeah, holy crap. I'm gonna do a really, really fast first infusion because I saw the color came out and I'm like, holy crap, I gotta. I didn't intend to um, decant it that quickly, but I... look how look how dark it got. Wow, <laughs> it got really dark super quickly. Ooh. We're going to be awake in just a little bit, Steven. Wow! Holy crap, that's really good! Wow! Screw that person. That person is so good. I hate this woman who- oh my god, this is stupid. Here, drink this. One sip wanders again. Eric, if you're still here, this is from Eman from Tea Habitat. Fuck that woman. She's so good at just curating everything. I hate her. Her tea is so good. Her tea is so good. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Oh my god. Wow. That's stupid. Okay, so explaining why. This was such a fast tea, but it's like on the sip, it's rich, it's floral, there's like forest going on, there's like herbaceous stuff going on, malty. I, I, I took one sip and that's it. It's just, <sighs> holy crap. Wow. And then the aftertaste is really kicking in. <sighs> wow. I hate Iman at Tea Habitat. She is so good at picking tea. Screw her and all her ancestors. They're better ancestors than me in terms of handing down tea, tea skills, tea, tea picking skills. Fuck. It's so good. It makes me so angry. Wow. That's just stupid. That's really, really dumb. That's stupid. That's just... Yeah, that's really, really dumb. <laughs> and if it's not clear, like, I, I really, 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 really love Iman and Tea Habitat. It's just so dumb that she's so good at picking tea. Like, how is that possible? Like. She's known for dance songs, but she's changed my mind about Dragon Well. She's changed my mind about Dian Hong. Like Dragon Well can be pretty good, but it's a for me. It's been like a flavor note forward tea. Like it reaches a certain level and it doesn't go past that for me. Like it's interesting, but it's not like a really touching tea, if that makes sense. But I feel like Iman's teas, whether it's her dance song, which she specializes in, or like her Dragon Well, her Dian Hong. Not only are they very tasty, and they they do more than they promise, they're just so, like, they hit you, and you're like, holy crap. <laughs> wow. Have you had a Dian Hall? It's like floral, herbaceous, malty, aromatic, smooth, silky, bold, you know, like a tiny bit of complexity, like like just a tiny bit of dryness to kind of round everything out. It's just got everything, and I've only had two sips. And I know I'm maybe talking ahead of myself, but wow, just stupid. <sighs> it's so dumb. <laughs> That's really dumb. I'm gonna cry. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, Sniffly. She is so dumb. I really recommend her. She's Tea Habitat, um, by the way. So. Yeah, I, I missed out on all you guys because unfortunately this tea is just so show-stopping, but I want to say hi to um, y'all who I missed out on. So Carolina, uh, YG is here. You guys are from, okay, hit us off from the Netherlands. So late. Yeah. Uh, Teapot Rescue Society. Oh, you're in Phoenix. It's just that the other, the, the tea house is from Bisbee. So welcome. You're not too far away from us. Uh, yeah. I'm glad that you guys are up late with us. 
11 p.m. is not that late in terms of hours, but I feel like it's pretty late for tea. <laughs> That's why I really respect you guys joining in and um, you guys know your limits in terms of caffeine or whatever. I, I can drink tea pretty late if it's pretty good tea. <sighs> yeah, so this is from Tea Habitat. It's show-stoppingly good. I know I do this all the time on stream. It's not that I'm trying to make things up. It's very difficult for me to pretend I like a tea if I don't like it. So if you notice, I will not do blind reviews of teas I've never tried before unless I know the person um, and kind of trust their taste. Uh, I just don't want to throw a vendor under the bus in case it's just not my style of tea. But I just had so much confidence in this sample from Tea Habitat because this lady is just... It's her 2018 Pine Needle Yunnan Black Tea. It is very piney. It's very foresty. I bet you like that. Steven likes foresty things. <laughs> it does smell like a walk in the forest, doesn't it? It's just super clean. Oh, wow. There is like a kind of pine sap thing going on, right, Steven? Just, yeah. just being in the forest vibes. And it does everything you want a black tea to do, and then it does the being in the forest vibes. It's not sacrificing anything I want from a Dian Hong. It just does what it needs to, and then extra. You know? And you want that from a tea. Wow. Just crazy. <laughs> Renan says I want to try that stupid tea now. Uh, it's just really good. I, I will admit, I didn't like Dian Hong for a long time. I, I thought it was okay. Right? It was probably my, I'd say my least favorite black tea for a long time because I like the sweetness of Fujian and I like the the boldness of Assam and the Nepalese teas tend to be very fragrant, same with Darjeeling black teas and then Yunnan was kind of like in the middle where it's not super Fujian and sweet and it's not super malty and bold just kind of in the middle, and I felt like I could get that from the other two places if I just brew them a certain way. So Yunnan black teas weren't my super favorite, you know? I like the kind of sweet potato thing you can get from them, I like the maltiness you can get from them. But there are certainly Fujian teas that can do that, right? So I, I got this from her, like, I think uh, a year and a half ago, and I said, I don't really like Dian Hong when she wanted to brew me one. like. Maybe you can, yeah, I just don't get them. She's like, oh, just, just try this. Just try this. Yeah, and she changed my mind. It's just, wow. This sucks. I hate her. <laughs> she is in LA. Yeah. Uh, Shiloh's here. Tea Habitat is in LA. I'm sorry. I just got so excited. Yeah. <laughs> Eric is right. I have not had a bad or even mediocre tea from her. I don't love everything from her, but everything is very solid. She doesn't give a fuck. I mean, it's in a good way. If, if you don't like her tea, she's not going to get offended about it. She's like, okay. <laughs> I asked her, you know, which is your favorite Don song this year? The first time I met her too, the very first time. Eric, you were there. Eric's the one who introduced me to her. I drove Eric down to LA and he fell asleep the entire time. Uh, this is before I, I started dating Steven, otherwise I would have made Steven drive. And I asked Iman, what's your favorite dance song? And she says, they're all the same to me. It's just, they're just dance songs. I get them every year. And it's just so opposite from what you expect a tea vendor to do, right? Like, I've, I've sold tea before. I don't anymore. But in terms of trying to get someone to buy something, you at least have to make up what you think your favorite is to try to get them to buy something. She's like, it's the same every year. I get good tea every year and I like them all. I don't really have a favorite. <laughs> yeah. So this is actually the pine needle Deanna Hong from her. Again, I'm not paid by anyone to plug any of these teas. She's just great. Her tea is so good. All, just anything from her is just so dumb. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to get off my getting angry at Iman for being so good at sourcing tea. If it wasn't clear enough, it's just incredible how, how good she is. That's all. When someone's just that good, you're like, what? <laughs> it's, not, it's not possible for everyone, for someone to do everything so right. How is that possible? 
Right? Everyone has to have a weakness. I've had good white tea from her, good green tea, good oolong, good poer, good black tea. When does that ever happen from the same vendor if you're really thinking critically about the vendor, right? All five categories? You serious? <sighs> That's so foresty. Wow. Really foresty. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Yep. That's just show shopping like good. Anyway, <clears throat> we're supposed to be focusing on this tea, but it's just so good. <laughs> You know when a tea is just so good that you just can't think anymore, but in a good way. <laughs> yeah, Shiloh, welcome to the stream. You came in when I was freaking out. And yes, I do do it a lot, but to be fair, I, I do take a lot of good time to choose the teas that I like, which is why this happens a lot. And the teas I don't really like, I tend to not want to drink on stream. Otherwise, I get mad at how mediocre they are, and then I go, I get into a bad mood. Or I space out because I get a bad tea drunk, and you guys have seen what happens. When that happens, it's not fun, and it's... yeah. <laughs> I'd rather freak out in a good way about a tea than freak out in a bad way, to be honest. Um, Danny Lowar Pichowski and Si Wongo, welcome to Tea Practice today. We're having some incredible black tea from Tea Habitat. Yeah, this is the stuff here. See, look how crappy the packaging is. I don't even care. People are like, it's a crappy packaging. How could it be good? But <laughs> honestly, sometimes the best teas come in the most crappy packaging. And I'm not even mad that she used this to pack it. She just doesn't, she's like, the tea will speak for itself. It doesn't matter if it's 10% less awesome because it's in a plastic bag like this. It just shows. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I like good packaging, but if someone hands me a bag like this and I know them, I'm like, oh man, this is gonna be good. <laughs> Sometimes I just want to, you know? Yeah. Um, oh, M. Pfeiffer, is that you, Michael? Right? Is that right? I think I got an email from you. So I was like, oh, finally I'm getting people's first names. <laughs> so don't have to, like, struggle with your usernames on Instagram. Although the person that probably will not change the the hello to is Shiloh, who is, again, nuev underscore knowledge underscore orden. Uh, gotcha Ree says, you don't know until you try the tea. Good tea persists. Yeah, I agree. I've had so many like teas packed like this, and in the beginning of my tea journey, I'm like, what the? why would you do that? The tea is so good, and now I don't even care. <laughs> Because like a tea that's half as good, but in better packaging, will still be half as good. If you minus 10% from this tea, it's still 90%, while the other tea is 50%. <laughs> Joe, good thing you aren't adverse to bad packaging. Oh yeah, we don't. If you go to China and Taiwan and you walk into someone's like tea warehouse, it's just like plastic bags full of tea. And they use the same plastic bags to throw the trash in. I'm not saying it's every single warehouse, but once you see that, all of your kind of like, oh my god, the tea has to be the sacred thing, and I can't use my hands to touch it and stuff. That's why you'll see me just like use my hands to like pluck like leaves out of the bag and dump them in, and it, it doesn't look that great on paper because we're used to like using like a metal spoon and stuff like that, and I still like to do that if I have the I'm in the mood, but if I'm just having tea by myself, I'll just use my hands, I'll, you know, whatever with the bags and stuff like that. There's, it's just it's just a way of life for them there, and I like touching the leaves, right? Like, you get to, like, get to know them before you start growing, so. Yeah. And anything I say, it's not like one thing's better than the other. Of course, I bet this tea would be better tasting if it was in a Ziploc bag. But what am I gonna do? Iman, like, give me a Ziploc bag for that amazing tea you're gonna send home with me. Like, as a, cause I bought a bunch of tea from her and she sent me this as like a last minute sample. Like, oh, wait, 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 you don't like Jan Hong right here. Here you go. <laughs> when someone gives you a sample of tea, when you've told them you don't like it and they have that much confidence, you know it's gonna be good. Cause they, they know something that you don't. But now I know. Thanks, Iman. Steven, what else would you say about this tea? Foresty, right? It's just 
you can really taste the leaves in this tea and I really appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna go really quick into the Nepalese tea just to give it some some air time before we end up not getting to it. So I do love Nepal and while Nepalese teas aren't like the best processed teas in the world I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. I just wish I did them first because this tea honestly when you're designing a tea tasting for yourself or for a group of people, you need to put the better teas at the end. Otherwise, a tea like this good or better, like this is not the best tea in the world, but it, holy crap, it's really good for a Dian Hong. Um, it's getting really close up there. You need to put the better tea at the end. Because <laughs> you don't want to go downhill, right? And I love Nepal, but I haven't found a lot of Nepalese teas that are just AAA grade, like really, really, really show stopping. There are a couple of them, and I would like to try um, Jeremy if you're still here. I know Camellia sinensis in Canada works with Jun Chiabari quite a bit, and Jun Chiabari is supposed to be a really, really good Nepalese tea producer. I didn't get to visit them when I was visiting there. Um, they're doing some fun stuff. So, Nepal, I think. A big origin to look out for, lots of big origins to look out for, but Nepal has the really good leaf material, they got some curiosity, they've got the will to learn, and then the people there are very nice. So, yeah, I think so. Let's see, uh, Shiloh says, packaging preconceptions are altered after going to China and visiting tea producers. Agree! It's almost like if it looks too nice, I get suspicious which has backfired for me. I've met a couple people who have really good tea, but I kind of judge them from afar because I'm like, it looks a little bit too good. A good example of this is Boon Tea in LA. They're a new tea company I met at UC Davis. They have just gorgeous packaging, really beautiful and kind of, you know, girly. I think I can say that because I'm a girl, right? Pretty feminine. So sometimes you imagine, oh, they're just going to have some really crappy, like hibiscus tea blended with whatever, but they have really good tea. So, both ways, you know, just don't just drink the tea. Don't, don't judge the, don't judge the, <laughs> don't judge the tea by its packaging either way. Yeah. Okay, really quick. Let's do this Nepalese tea. Um, I know I'm rushing, but symbolically, I don't want to leave it out. That was my biggest problem when preparing for any kind of tea brewing like challenge is I run out of time because I like to take my time talk about the tea. You know, I just do another twenty minutes, right? Yeah, I could do that. Wow. This smells really good. I think we will need another 20 minutes, if you guys don't mind. If you got somewhere to go, especially all in Europe, it's already the next day, let me know. But, or just don't show up in the next live, but we will follow up this with another live to have some time for the Nepalese tea. Finish that Dian home for me. Eamon, wherever you are. she in this direction? No, she's in the other direction. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Every morning I need to like wake up and like pour my, like boil my kettle in the direction of Iman because she's incredible. I hate her. <laughs> so this next one, yeah, actually let's talk about this one in the next video just in case someone uh, walks into the next one without knowing what this is. Is that okay with you? Yeah? We'll give it a couple more seconds for the Dian Hong to do its magic. Oh, wow. Oh, I gotta sneeze. <coughs> maybe, maybe Eamon's thinking about me too. I hope he's thinking about me too. <laughs> yeah, that's a tea crush for sure. I have so many tea crushes. Uh, so yeah, those of you who are here, thank you for joining us so far. This is the you know first two thirds of the black tea practice we're doing today. If you'd like to join us, we're going to go on a second live to do the Nepalese black tea before we sign off. I don't want to forget that side of Asia that's making amazing teas, so we'll see you in a little bit. 
Maybe I might die of corona in between. That's not a, that's not a good joke. Guys, don't make me make bad jokes! That's your fault! Okay, see you guys in a little bit, okay? Gosh, bad jokes. <sighs> yeah. It's super good. <laughs> We're doing the last third of our tea practice today with some more black tea. This time we'll jump from China, which we've been spending a lot of time in China the last couple weeks with the poor challenge and all of that. We're gonna go to Nepal. I haven't been giving a lot of love to my Nepalese friends in a while. This is the Sagarmatha Gold, I think. Is it gold or black? Yeah, Sagarmatha Gold from Nepali Tea Traders. It's an organic black tea. Where is it from? Um, I think it's from Jaspere, which I've actually been to that area. And it's very interesting. Very, very high up in the Himalayas. Uh, I mean, the Himalayas are very high up anyway, but there are parts of Nepal that are a little bit lower and they're very hot. And then once you go up into the mountains, it gets really, really cold and really interesting. Actually, the, the mist kind of reminds me a bit of the Taiwanese landscape, but in a very different way. Really cool tea is coming out from Nepal, so I'm glad I get to share this with you guys today. Welcome back to our friends Hidestok. Steven, I guess, is back here. He's not going anywhere. Uh, Jeremy, who was talking to us about Jun Bari, another Nepalese tea producer. Asu Lighty, Nyanka S. Becker, Lion, Luke CF2, 23 Axelal, and the Teapot Rescue Society. From all parts of the world, we're kind of coming in from today. The Netherlands, Las Vegas, Missouri. From just outside of Montreal, but not quite Montreal. <laughs> Mexico City. Where else? Um, did I say Phoenix already? Phoenix is not too far away from Vegas, but I've only been there like once. Driven through. <laughs> driven through. My, my favorite Vietnamese place is actually in Phoenix. It's called Cafe something something. Hey, Teapot Rescue Society, do you know what I'm talking about? This is like Vietnamese cafe and they have amazing pho, but they also have macarons. For some reason, I I just remember that place. It's just the best Vietnamese food I've ever had. I'm not saying a lot because Vegas has pretty good Vietnamese food. It's not the best, but we do have a really good Chinatown here, so we get lots of really good kind of Asian cuisine here. But Phoenix didn't expect to find good Vietnamese food there. <laughs> Jeremy says Jeremy's trying just trying to save himself. Hashtag the suburbs. I'm in Las Vegas, dude. So you know. I don't gotta hashtag the suburbs or anything. Luke CF is in Germany. Ace Light is from Qatar. Wow. They're just so cool. They're just... I, like, I can like face my kettle that way and hit one of you and then face my kettle the other way and hit another one of you. I really like that. I'm half joking, but that kind of stuff really means a lot to me. Being able to be connected from far away. So thanks for tuning in today and kind of connecting the world in this little teeth tea thread that wraps us all together. Ooh. Wow. That's really tasty. So this, this tea we're drinking to round out the session, this is the second half of this live, is a Nepalese black tea. If you've had Darjeeling, it's probably the closest approximation you can get to the Nepalese taste. But if you've had Nepalese black tea, you're also not going to want to compare it to Darjeeling because it's just completely different. Um, I think there's actually a little bit of sensitivity there in terms of Nepalese teas being called Darjeeling teas because while they are very close and there are parts of Nepal that are right across the road, you know, it's literally right across the road when one side's Darjeeling, one side's Nepal. Uh, Nepal is its own country, it's its own ethnic groups, own language, own kind of approach to tea. And for a long time, they were kind of seen as a feeder area to supply Darjeeling with extra leaves. And it makes sense because Darjeeling has this big brand and Darjeeling leaves of any kind will be selling higher than almost anything else in India. It's very famous, right? And for good reason, the, the terroir is very good, the altitude is very high, makes for very aromatic teas. So Darjeeling, as many of you know, very aromatic bright teas. Nepal on the other side, how I kind of differentiate between Nepalese and Darjeeling teas is that Darjeeling tends to just to be a tiny bit more floral and the Nepalese teas kind of have more of this 
earthy, radishy, almost like potatoey taste. It's an all often a little bit of menthol. It's, it's difficult to describe. I think you just have to taste them to get used to the differences, but I feel like I can tell if it is from the Nepalese side, especially if it's not right on the border with Darjeeling. Do I know 100% of the time? No. Do I care? I'd rather just know who's selling it to me so that they can tell me. So typically, if something is labeled Nepalese, it's gonna be Nepalese. They're not gonna label it Nepalese because if they're labeling it Darjeeling, they'll typically get more money, right? But if you're buying Darjeeling, there is a chance that some of that leaf material is from Nepal that they kind of took over the border to sell as Darjeeling tea because they they're going to make more from that leaf material. Makes sense. It's not always. But this is very, very good. Super aromatic. Wow. Really good. Sweet, fragrant, bright. The other two teas weren't very bright. This is very bright, like very morning timey, very alive, kind of lively and dancey. Try some, Stephen. Very tasty. I'm pretty impressed by that tea's ability to stand up after that Yunnan pine needles from the tea habitat. That was just stupid. <laughs> uh, Martin from Read 80. How's it going, my friend? We are probably sleeping at 80 degrees right now, so we're just, we're just... We're just summoning you. <laughs> ah, yes. Sleep number two coming up with this Nepalese block. Asu uh, which vendors do you recommend for Darjeeling and Nepalese teas? I mean, this, this company is Nepali Tea Traders, so you can get this exact same tea from them. They're at nepaliteatraders.com. Um, I haven't tried a whole bunch of their teas, but I've tried quite a few. Not all of them are my favorite. I think that's pretty fair because a lot of the Nepal teas are not going to be as, you know, solid as the Chinese teas. They just have some more work to do. You have to give them a little bit of a, a break because they are a relatively new tea making industry. China's got like hundreds of years. Like if your granddad figured out something and then told your dad about it and then you get to know about it, you got an advantage, right? In Nepal, they're pretty new, so even basic things like how to pick the tea that you want for that certain kind of style or the withering is a little bit more challenging for them. But I think these are very easy fixes once they figure out how to do a certain processing step. The quality improves by a lot. So I feel like the Nepalese teas we were seeing in the early 2000s versus right now, they've improved a lot in terms of quality. We also live in the information age, right? Like in Nepal, it's not like they're just up in the boonies with no electricity at all whatsoever. It's probably that way like 20 years ago. But now they got internet, they can watch the same farmer leaf and crimson lotus and May leaf videos you can too. It's true. <laughs> so whereas before, you know, they were like, oh, we've never seen silver needle before. What is that thing? They've probably seen it online. <laughs> I'm not saying you can learn how to process tea just from watching a YouTube video, but if you have no idea where to start, it kind of helps a little bit to watch a video. So it is very interesting and um, another good company for them, oh I like them a lot, is Young Mountain Tea. Um, they're based out of Oregon. My friend Raj has been working on that company for a good like five, six years now, I think. And he works directly with those producers and kind of helps them develop their processing. And let's say you get a tea from Young Mountain and you tell him your feedback. Raj actually takes that feedback and when he goes back, he'll tell them. And that's the benefit of working with these newer regions is that they're actually a little bit more open to the feedback in terms of like, oh, try this. Or I think that this wasn't that, you know, we didn't like that about that one tea. Whereas if you try to tell someone from Wii what to do, they're gonna be like, nah. <laughs> not saying everyone. They're certainly very open-minded tea makers, and I think any tea maker from anywhere that's gonna be open-minded is gonna be better because they're always learning. But chances are you're not gonna be able to give feedback to a Chinese tea maker as well as you can for a. Nepalese or Indian or Kenyan or you know other other regions you know a good example of this is Bitaco if you guys have seen them they're from Colombia they're a company that's 
started to do a lot of interesting teas from Colombia. I know that they started kind of rocky. I remember trying their samples a long time ago. Not very competitive, but now years later, because of the feedback loop between them and the market, they've kind of bumped up the quality quite a bit. So it's interesting for us as CST drinkers. The tea industry isn't this holy place that you can't influence at all. Oftentimes it does happen that the feedback loop makes a difference in the taste. So yeah, Young Mountain Tea. And then Camellia Sinensis is this long, long time purveyor of Darjeeling teas, and I think now some Nepalese teas, so I highly recommend them as well. Uh, yeah, Camellia Sinensis has been, I think, yeah, they've been doing Darjeeling sourcing since longer than I've been alive, not joking. <laughs> I make that joke a lot, but I think Kevin and team have been working with Darjeeling since like the 1980s. I'm not sure if anyone in Camellia is here in the chat right now. TJ was earlier. He was the one talking about Junchi Abari. Uh, yeah, TJ's still here. Why would I doubt you, Jeremy? Why do I, why do I doubt this kid? Why do I, he's 40, 40 out of 7 and poor love. Why would I doubt him? I'm sorry, Jeremy. I just thought you had something better to do, but what's better to do than tea, right? <laughs> yeah, so Camellia Sinensis' Darjeeling's are really good. For good reason. They just know. So I'm glad that Jeremy's backing me up. Since the 80s, we weren't born yet. We, were, we really weren't born yet. So I have that big respect for them. And they're always learning too. I like, I like curiosity at tea vendor, right? What are we, too curious? <laughs> um, A.LA Lisa is here. And Marcel from t -Log. how's it going, friend? It's been almost a year since I met you in Taiwan. Jeez, how time flies. Yeah, that was in April, I think, Marcel. I'm not sure if, he, if he's even still in chat, but I met Marcel <laughs> in April of last year, and he had his big backpack on, and like mostly, I think most of the weight in his backpack was like camera gear and tea. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Cha Chai Tea is here too, and Space Between Black and White. Welcome! Let us know what you're drinking today. We've been discussing some Darjeeling Nepalese kind of industry things as we're drinking this Golden Needles from... Nepal. Now, do I want to call this Golden Needles? That's an interesting discussion because a lot of the Indian, Nepalese, kind of new origins of tea want to name their teas after the classic Chinese teas, right? So the Nepalese tea makers will want to call their like white needle teas, white bud teas, silver needle. And they're going to want to call their rolled oolongs once they get the Taiwanese machines, like Iron Goddess or Jade Oolong. And I've always wondered about that. I've always kind of like told my Nepalese tea friends, like, maybe you should just make your own name so that you can have your own kind of brand. Because just basically on Google, you'll never overtake the Chinese Golden Needle, right? But if you have your own name, like Sagar Matha Gold, which is the name of this tea, you could maybe start building your own, um, your own brand, right? It's interesting, but I will call this a golden needle just in terms of the, the leaf material is the buds only of the plant. So, yeah. Um, Jeremy, been doing schoolwork this morning for the sole purpose of making up time to watch the live. Why would I doubt him? Um. <laughs> Sorry, Jeremy. I should just not doubt you. Um, if I was a shirt, shirt, shirt wearing person, I would have a Don't Doubt Jeremy shirt and also Steven Wasn't Born Yet shirt. Those two things, I think. But I don't wear shirts. <laughs> um, Jagger product? Dude, I haven't seen you in a long time. How's it going? Um, and Cha Chai Tea is here. Uh, Space Between Black and White says, yes, naming them is fun with proper backing information, of course. Yeah, I agree. I like them to name things after like what's in Nepal because we taught ourselves how to use all the Chinese tea names, right? Like Xinyang, Mao Jian, and Dian Hong and stuff. Why not learn how to use Nepalese native names like Sagar Matha Gold? I don't know where Sagar Matha is though. Is that a place or a, a name? I should know that because I know what the Chinese words are, right? Like why, why not? Of course, there is that whole like a lot of the educated business people in Nepal and India will speak some English, so they want to like 
name things in English, but I'd like to see some like native Nepalese names coming from them. Like teach us how to speak, speak Nepalese too. A lot of us have learned how to speak Chinese just to learn more about Chinese tea or Japanese to learn more about Japanese tea. I don't see why not with, uh, with that part of the world. This is very, very good, by the way. The tasting notes are supposed to be honey, maple, maple, caramel, and roasted almonds. Sort of. That's the downside of tasting notes is if you don't have the right water, if you don't have the same water or brewing parameters as whoever wrote those notes, you're going to get different notes. For me, I do get honey from it. I get a tiny bit of maple. It's kind of woodsy, bright, a little bit citrusy. Good stuff. It's almost like Ceylon, but more perfume. This kind of tea. And that aromatic quality is coming from the fact that it is very high elevation. Tendencies are the high elevation teas will have a lot more like explosive aroma if they're oxidized. So that's why like Taiwanese black high mountain teas are very, very, very floral, punchy, fragrant, etc. Good stuff. Yeah. As we wrap up the session, let me know what you guys are drinking to round everything out. We've got some friends from the Netherlands, Qatar, the outskirts of Montreal. We're from Vegas, down in Arizona, I think, if uh, Teapot Rescue Society is still here. Vegas fam, also repping. <laughs> yeah. Third, fourth is sheep. I got some sweet potato as well. Very, very nice, satisfying thing going on. Space between black and white is Colorado. Nice. I got some uh, good tea friends in Colorado. Where in Colorado, my friend? Got some friends in Boulder. Got some friends in. I think Happy Lucky's is in Color. No. Is it Colorado Springs? I forget. No, I don't think it's Colorado. Is it? Maybe. Just need to go back to Colorado. <laughs> oh, Boulder. Fort Collins. Oh, Fort Collins. That's right. It's Fort Collins. I forget. Boulder's really nice, though. You guys have... Do you have a nice view of the mountains from where you're at? Boulder's very... Uh, I like Boulder a lot. Very fancy. It's more fancy than expected. Um, Asu Lighty from Qatar is having Lapsang Sutrang. Is it, I think it's very early there, like really early in the morning, I think, for you, right? Or really late at night. I'm not sure which. <laughs> and Cha Chai Tea is from British Columbia. And then my friend Lion, who's still here, is having that wild Taiwanese black tea. Thanks for joining us for the black tea practice today. Um, and the Lapsang Sutrang, nice, nice. Um, he's drinking wild Taiwanese black tea with blackberry notes and a little menthol. I find that the wild Taiwanese black teas do indeed have that menthol taste. There is a menthol -y taste here too. I find that it shows up in some Nepalese teas. Look look for it. I'm not sure if you guys have seen that before in Nepal teas. They're not as common, so check them out. They're good. They're good. Um, space between black and white. I do. I'm on the creek at the base of the mountain. Must be nice. We see some mountains here too. But they have no trees on them because we're in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> We're whining. At least we have a mountain view, Stephen. It's not too bad. Hida stocks having some roasted iwu oolong. Ace to light, it's 12 a.m. Wow. Cheers to you guys. Seriously. Netherlands, I imagine, is 11, 11 p.m. Probably closer to 12 a.m. now. Or maybe 10? This is very satisfying. Something to note is that these Nepalese teas will be cheaper than your Chinese black tea. So the Pine Needles Black is no joke in terms of price. It's not a very expensive tea, but you are getting more mileage from the Nepalese black teas in terms of the flavor profile. Um, I'm very pleased by the amount of value I'm getting from this tea. So that's something to look out for if you're looking for something interesting, something compelling, a tea from like a Nepal or Brazil, Colombia, Indonesia will be cheaper than something from a very established area like China or Japan, which might be a little bit obvious, but I think a common 
uh, like judgment or misconception people have is that the quality will be a lot less than from China or Japan. But I've had Dan Hong that's a lot worse than this, that's for sure, right? Like this is very sweet, it's very soft, nice aftertaste, it's got all the markers of a good Chinese tea, to be honest. Like if we're looking for the standards, it does meet the standard. I'm not having to make any excuses for it. I will tell you if it is not meeting the mark because I have tasted a lot of Nepalese teas that not quite at the standard. Uh, I used to go source teas in Nepal back in my wholesale tea days and there's a lot of bad tea out there like there is in a lot of China and Japan. It's up to your vendor to kind of be your, be your shield and pick some teas that won't poison you <laughs> with how bad they are. When you're working with like mountain, uh, young mountain tea and Nepali tea traders who go to Nepal and work with these growers, for every one tea they bring out from out of there, there's like 50 teas behind that that they had to try that wasn't, they weren't quite right, and then they found the one. So pretty, pretty good work on their part, I think. Same with Camellia sinensis, by the way. Although I, I watched Kevin, Kevin's one of the founders of Camellia. And I saw his, uh, he did a documentary for either French or French-Canadian television. So it's totally in French with uh, English subtitles. And they followed him traveling through Darjeeling and stuff. He just seems to know that area really well. He even knows like little patches where the good Darjeeling, you were there during Northwest Tea Fest, right? When you have that long-standing relationship with those growers, you can almost like pick and choose. Like, oh, I want the tea from that patch. That's my favorite, <laughs> which he showed during the documentary. And like, that's the one, that one over there. And it's not just being hoity-toity. It's just the right angle of the sun, the the soil, the water that's in that specific area, the shade. And camellias, I feel I feel like not just Darjeeling, but Indian anything has just really been solid for me. Yeah, I overfilled my cup. It's a sign. I'm just so full of joy. Ooh! Four steep on this Nepalese tea. It's still going. You had to respect this Nepalese tea. It's sometimes these, uh, you know, the teas from other origins don't live up to those standards we've been talking about. It's just, you know, it needs to have some stamina, some generosity. If your tea is good, but it only lasts three steeps, there's a problem somewhere. If not in terms of taste, but in terms of just the value of the tea, you want it to last more than three steeps if you're doing it in a gaiwan, right? Very generous, really good value. Um, Jeremy says about Kevin from Camellia, what a man, he has contacts. Does he have contacts? Is that why he doesn't have glasses? It's a bad joke. <laughs> he just knows. I've always had a really, really big tea crush in Kevin. I have a lot of big tea crushes. I get one at a rate of about once a week. <laughs> These days, it seems like. Yeah. Steven will just, you know, hear me like, I hate that! I hate insert person here because they're just so good. Yeah. <laughs> earlier was Lion. What's that? Earlier oh, yeah, was. earlier today was Lion. I hate him. <laughs> I hate him! And Lion posted a picture of his uh, tea room on Discord. I was like, I hate that guy! I've actually been to that tea room too, but it doesn't cease to impress me how good the tea room is. You gotta, yeah, you just gotta, you gotta look up to some tea people, you know? There's always gonna be someone better than you, and the faster you can look up to them and not just be like hating on them, the better. And it's not like I hate on them, I'm just like, they're just so good! <laughs> can I have like two more lifetimes to be that good? Ugh. <sighs> Yeah, like I'll never be Kevin, I'll never be Lion, I'll never be Jeremy, Mr. Forty Pores, I'll never be Shiloh, but I can just be me, and I guess that's good enough, right? Let's wrap up with this last steep here. We got some Lapsam Sutra, Taiwanese Wild Tea, what else? Jeremy, are you still in the Dongding? How's that going for you? Or did he actually head out, or was he just joking? I don't know. <laughs> Lion, who's another person I hate. I'm brewing my Taiwanese tea and Taiwanese clay. It's the best I've had it. I'm glad, I'm glad that's working out for you. I'm very warm right now. Are you very warm? When the three teas you've had are making you feel very comfortable and not sick at all, it's a good thing. 
I'm very sensitive to tea and when there's something wrong with the tea, I can get kind of sick, get a headache, feel very uncomfortable, feel too full. This has been really good. Maybe it's a good company. Yeah. Good energy from far away. Yeah, really, really good. Jeremy says the Dong Ding from Floating Leaves was awesome. I have no words for it. I'm glad that it's making it up for, to you for mm. the customs hit. I shouldn't remind him about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So we got some Dong Ding, Taiwanese wild black tea, Nepalese black tea, Lapsong Su Chong. Um, what else? I think. I, f I forgot one other thing. Um, the forest one that Tea Pot Rescue Society was having earlier. I forgot which one it was. <laughs> yeah. Friends from far away. Whew. Yeah. So I'm going to wrap up in just a little bit. I'm just very, very satisfied. And it's going to be hard to do chores because we're just so relaxed. I want some cookies now, I think. Just, just a tiny bit tea munchies. Not too bad. We're going to brew these out too, Steven. Especially the... Oh my god. It smells like a forest. Do you have a black tea that smells like the forest? Because I have one right here. <laughs> so three different black teas. Similar leaf material, right? We're all dealing with buds. Right? Let me show you the Nepalese black tea just to prove it. Here's the buds, right? This is Nepalese black tea over here. Here's a Yunnan black tea. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference if you were brewing them, right? Yunnan over here from China and Nepalese over here from, I think, um, Elam in, in Nepal. It's a province of their own. They look very similar. Tastes very different though, and that's because of the processing, the place where they come from, the tehua, right? The environment where these teas come from. And yeah, overall, you know, they've got a lot of punch to them. Buds will tend to have a lot of like the tea stuff in them. They're the best part of the plant, so they have they pack a lot of strength. But it's also not broken up. Like actually, the most shredded up one is the the Fujian one, which I'm not the biggest fan of how shredded it is. Maybe because it was a sample and I crushed it at some point. But the the leaves are very small tiny shredded it t it brewed up really really nice though so i suspect it's because it was a sample that it was broken up you can tell if something was shredded up before or after it was processed by how much bitterness comes out from the shredding if the tea is broken up before it's finished processing it was probably it's probably going to become more bitter if you trust me like if you take like some da hong pao or like some big leaf black tea you crush it up as long as you don't overbrew it it's going to be less bitter than you think, even if it might break your heart trying to crush up the leaves. Once it's finished, it's not going to develop extra astringency. You just have to make sure not to overbrew it because of the increased surface area. So I think in this case, this probably started out looking a lot better than this, but because it was in that small sample, it ended up being more crushed than I wanted it to be. But yeah, my favorite one, actually, I think is the Yunnan, followed by the Oh, <coughs> someone's thinking about me somewhere. Oh, excuse me. The Yunnan first, and then I think the Nepalese. It was just very sweet, really good value. The leaves are beautiful. Look how big and kind of full those buds are. And very even, nice color. You're looking for evenness in the color, both of these. And then while I like this one, the Fujian black tea, which is often my favorite. I really like Fujian black teas probably my least favorite but not because it wasn't bad or not because it wasn't good but because the other ones were just so delicious so yunnan nepal fujian somewhere a fujianese black tea maker is like there's no way the nepalese people don't <laughs> that's deep for you though anyway thanks for joining us for today's black tea golden needle practice tomorrow i think i already know what i want to do tomorrow i'm going to steal something from delphine Gosh, how do I say her last name? Jean Grog? Delphine Gingras, if I'm being American about it. She is actually one of the um, people who hosts tea over at Camellia Sinensis in Quebec. Also one of the people who uh, is on the Discord. I also hate her. She's another person I hate a lot. 
Um, she's just really great. You might have seen her on the lives on Camellia Sinensis if you follow them. She showed me a technique yesterday. Uh, oh, on Discord. She showed us a technique on Discord. She learned from World Tea Expo last year where you put the leaves of a green tea on top of the filter and then you pour over the leaves and then you let the, the liquor drop down. Does that make sense? I'll, I'll show you using, yeah, example here. Over here, right? And then you'll pour leaves, uh, you'll pour water over the leaves, almost like coffee. And then there's a filter in the bottom, so the um, liquor drops down. And it apparently changes the flavor of the tea, brings out more aroma. So we'll be trying out that method tomorrow. I'm gonna ask Delphine for some tips and tricks later today, so I can get, get it right tomorrow. But that should be interesting. I've never done that before. We'll call it the, the tea pour over, I guess. So join us tomorrow for something a little bit more brewing focused. I think today was more like tea side by side focused, a little bit of brewing, but tomorrow's all about experimenting with a new brewing style where we'll do a pour over over the leaves and let them drip down. Take that coffee. We can do what you guys can too. <laughs> so thank you again for joining us today. Gosh, Chakra Sade and Neil is a base. You guys are... Now I want to stay and hang out with you guys. Have some black tea with us during the replay or something. But catch us tomorrow, okay? For that pour over method that we'll try via um, Delphine from Quebec City. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Happy weekend. Cheers.